behind me. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Arbel Lecture. My name is Christian Ronesta. I'm the outgoing chair of the Arbel Board at the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters. At the end of the 19th century, the Norwegian mathematician Sufus Lee initiated an effort to establish an international prize in mathematics in honor of Niels Henrik Abel. This effort failed, but was taken up again a hundred years later. 200 years after the birth of Abel, the prize bearing his name was established by the Norwegian government. The main objective is to recognize pioneering scientific achievements in mathematics. The prize is also intended to help boost the status of the field of mathematics in society and stimulate children and youth to become interested in mathematics. With an annual allocation on the government budget, the Academy is given the responsibility to award the prize organize a novel week highlighted by the award ceremony and support outreach activities. These include mass competitions and an annual teacher award in the name of Holmbo, the teacher of Nils Henrik Abel. The prize committee has five members, four of whom are nominated by the IMU and the European Mass Society. This support by the international math community is invaluable for the success of the prize within the field and beyond. This Arbel Lecture at the ICM is the third in a row. It is sponsored by the Arbel Board and is part of the effort to heighten the awareness of the prize in the international math community. The lecture is given by an Arbel Laureate who will be introduced now by the former president of IMU and honorary member, now honorary president of this ICM, Professor Jakob Pallis. <clears throat> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Dear Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome Sir Michael Atia to deliver a talk at the Abel Lecture at the ICM 2018, entitled The Future of Mathematical Physics, New Ideas in Old Bottles. It must be a a nice uh, English uh, statement, old bottles. Atia is a winner of the Fields Medal in 1966, and more recently the Abel Prize, which I had the honor of being the president of the International Mathematical Union on the occasion of the creation of such an important Prize. He was, Professor Atia, the past president of the Royal Society of London and the Royal Society of Edinburgh, and the former master of Trinity College, Cambridge. And since 1997, he has been an honorary professor at the University of Edinburgh. Please. Atia is best known for the index theorem devised in 1963 with Isadore Singer of MIT, properly called the Atia Singer Index Theorem, connecting analysis and topology. A fundamental fact that proved to be important in both mathematical fields and later in physics as well. 
He had many PhD students and more than 700 PhD descendants. In brief, ATIA inspired the existence of high-level mathematical activities at important institutions worldwide. In particular, I am very honored to say that he visited IMPA, our institute in Rio de Janeiro, many times and motivated a special program of high-level mathematical conference at our institute, whose chair is here, Professor Marcelo Viana, and some nearby ones. Please join me in welcoming Professor Michael Atia. Well, thank you very much, uh, both the Arbel Committee and to Professor Jacob Pallis, my old friend, uh, the former founder and director of IMPA. Uh, these are both organizations I've long had connections with, and I'm delighted to be here to speak, give the Arbel Lecture this year. Uh, I found this meeting extraordinarily interesting so far, so interesting, I've gone to all the lectures, I've understood the lectures, and I've had very little time to prepare my own lecture. So I'm sorry if this is not going to have the high technology that some of my predecessors have had. It's low technology. But I will try to do my best with some help. Now, uh, I'm going to talk about new ideas in old bottles. And I'm going to focus on some particular aspect. I'm going to talk about one of the oldest numbers in mathematics, pi. You all know what pi is, I hope. Pi, pi, yes, of course. The circle, ready. Pi is the oldest number known in mathematics. It goes back to Archimedes. And I'll show you shortly little history pictures. So let's go back to the past. And um, I got here some names of the past to remind you. Uh, I have Plato. There's holding up his finger, representing philosophy of the past, and then through the ages, we went through astronomy, geometry, algebra, and analysis, to the present time, to the future. In the past, before astronomy, there was astrology, where people predicted the future by looking at the stars. And Plato, as you see in this picture, you all recognize Plato, because he is fa famous for being in the portrait painted by Raphael, which is in the Vatican, uh, this man with a big beard, you know he's Plato. And on the right-hand side, there's a picture of famous James Clark Maxwell, the great scientist, philosopher, who, without whom the, you would not be here. He invented the laws of electromagnetic th theory of which all modern society rests. So this describes the history of mathematics from the past into the future. And I was going to, I have to press some buttons now I think if I press this button, oh no, wrong button. Is that right? Have I got a, you should be able to see there Archimedes. Do you see Archimedes? So, of course you all know what Archimedes looks like. Uh, if you want to look at it close up, you only got to work hard to get a Fields Medal. When you get a Fields Medal, you see Archimedes. So, it's very easy to see Archimedes. If you're young, you get it by, working hard. Uh, of course, he looks like what we think Archimedes looks like, uh, because he is a, obviously a great thinker. That is what we imagine Archimedes looked like. Of course, before him, it was Pythagoras. We don't know what Pythagoras looked like, but he had a big beard, obviously. And then I've drawn underneath some selected people who are great mathematicians, thinkers, uh, Isaac Newton, uh, and that is actually a portrait of Isaac Newton, painted which I had in my own rooms, Trinity College. There's Leonard Euler, you all know about Euler. And there is, of course, Ga the great Gauss. This is a selection of the people who've created the mathematics of the past. And I hope you all recognize them. Now, some stage, I'm going to 
let's see, this is modern technology. Um, let me see if I, what happens if I do this? I hope I've gone into the, into the complex path now. Uh, is that right? Yes, okay. So I, there I've, Abel, okay, this is the Abel lecture. You must see a picture of Abel. There are not very many pictures of Abel. This is a unique one, but it's been propagated in many forms. You can buy the Norwegian banknote, worth 500 krona, I think, which had Abel. So it doesn't cost you very much. 500 krona is not very much. You can get a picture of Abel, you can put it in your room. And then I've got next Abel, I've got the great Hamilton. Hamilton was the great Irish mathematical physicist who did many things, very famous. Uh, and as you'll see, amongst other things, he invented the algebra of quaternions. Uh, and then next to him, we have two people with beards. Uh, you had to have beard in those days to be taken seriously. Uh, and there is Riemann with a good black beard, and Maxwell with what I only call, uh, 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 what's the word I'm thinking of? Uh, enlightened beard, a, li a, bi a beard that shines with light. Since Maxwell was the person who explained that light was an electromagnetic phenomenon, it's very appropriate. He has a beard that looks like that. So these are the great figures of the past, or up, to, up to the time of Maxwell. Now I think at this stage, I should be um, telling what I'm going to do in the lecture. Um, my lecture, I said, was about looking to, the, looking to the future, but using the past. So first of all, we've got to go past, to the, to the past. And the past for me meant Archimedes and Pythagoras and so on. And so I'm going to start with the number pi. I mentioned pi, now here, I think I have to um, get pi up on the screen. But my friend here will point a laser at pi. I can't do it from here. Technology is not that advanced. I can't get a reflected laser. But I can point to my friend. He will point the laser. So hope, <laughs> hope you can see over there. Now, I, I've got a table in front of me here. So I'm going to tell you what this table is where all the mathematical content of this talk this lecture is going to be, have two parts. A lot of famous people, I'm showing you the famous people, and some a bit of ideas, and there I have the, I have this, the, the nitty gritty, the, the mathematical symbols, the mathematical symbols that encapsulate all the ideas. So this little table is, so to speak, a Rosetta Stone. Every, every, every symbol in that has a deep meaning, and I'm going to take you through the meaning. I don't, but I'll be kind. I won't give you the whole story. I'll only use a little bit of it. But it's good to see the whole picture. The part I'm going to focus on is pi. There is pi in the top row. First number, you see pi. You recognize pi? If you move further along that row, you'll find other numbers. You know what pi is? It's, well, you know what it is. It's the ratio of the circumference of a circle to the diameter. But we also know number, pi is a number. It's 3 point, you know, one, four, oh, oh, oh. I don't know how many figures you know, but you can write it all down. And the next number after pi there is a number called gamma. This is Euler's constant. Euler had many famous things and he invented numbers. He invented gamma. Gamma is a mysterious number. I'm sure you know, you've heard about gamma. gamma. It is a nice value. It's just, I think it's about 0.5 something. I don't, can't rattle all. But it has a well-defined number and it's very important. It's one of Euler's creations. After that, we have another not famous number invented by Euler. It's called E. I hope you know what E is. It's the basis of natural logarithms. It is two point something or other, and it's all well known. But more importantly, it is the foundation of the exponential function. So these numbers are all very important in mathematics. Mathematics couldn't live without these numbers. Pi, gamma, and E. You know, what more do you need? You know, man can live on a few crumbs of bread, and mathematicians can live, if you are on a desert island, the, all you need is pi, gamma, and e. Now, uh, I'm going to talk about this table, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about each letter, each symbol, its history, its past, and on the right-hand side, on the left-hand side, there are mathematical constants, and, and the pi is a mathematical number, e is a number, these are all numbers. They're beautiful numbers in mathematics. On the right-hand side, I'm going to talk about physics. And physics, there are also very important numbers. Well, there are very important quantities. On the top row, I've got C. 
You all know what C is. It's the velocity of light. Now, what is more important than the velocity of light? You know, it determines our whole, all our waves. And besides C, there is a number called H. It should have a slash to it. It's called Planck's constant. Well, there are two versions of Planck's constant, H or H divided by 2 pi. Uh, this is Planck's constant. The Planck's constant is very fundamental to all physicists. And then the next number is Q of E. Now, E is a common letter. It's the most common letter in the English alphabet. And I think in probably many languages, E is the most common letter. So it's been overused. So E on the left-hand side is Euler's E. E on the right-hand side is the electron. Well, and the electron came after Euler, of course. So the E on the left-hand side is a bold E, and the E on the right-hand side is a weak E. That's the electron. And Q of E means the charge of the electron. So this is a very important quantity, the electron charge. If you're a physicist, you know all this. If, you don't, if you're a mathematician, this is your first course in physics. And, well, I've got a more complicated number underneath. G is called Newton's constant, and there's a formula there which I needn't bother you about just now, which relates Newton's constant with other constants. So that's history of physics in a nutshell. It, but I've called that physics of type 1. And I've also put let's, on the left-hand side little, different languages. We are used to using the Greek and Roman alphabet. A, B, C, alpha, beta, gamma. Pi is Greek, gamma is Greek. So we're used to using re Latin or Roman letters and Greek letters. But you see, the world is more to the world than Greek and Roman. There are other, other important languages. And for example, Russian, all the Slavic languages, uses Cyrillic. Cyrillic is named after Cyril, and that's in red. So Cyrillic is, you know, very common language. All the Russians here know Cyrillic, and people from other Slav countries. And so I've got that, in that row, I've given that color red. Well, in the old days, red stood for communism and so on, so, but that's no political significance. I had to have another color. I chose black and white, red, and then green, it's a good color. It stands out well. So now in that row, I've got numbers underneath the ones above. And underneath, well, uh, the R and the C, that column, uh, you wonder why that stands for. Well, R and C stand for the real numbers and the complex numbers. That's easy. And H, so that stands for the quaternions after Hamilton. And O, stands for the Arctonians, which come after that. But that's the bottom of the list. I'm only going to focus on uh, the first two rows. In fact, the whole lecture is going to be really about the first two rows. And in the first row, we have pi. Underneath it, in the column, you have a funny symbol. And if you're not Russian-speaking, you don't know that, well, how that's pronounced. So I'll tell you. My, I'm not very good at Russian, but it's pronounced Zh. If you've heard of names like Zhukov, uh, that, 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 that begins with Zh. So that's, that's the Russian letter. And I've drawn it underneath pi because it is going to be the, 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 the whole story of this lecture is about the relationship of pi with Zh. You might think it's just a language problem. No, no, it's much deeper than that. So, uh, and underneath the next letter, under gamma, I choose a letter in the Russian or Cyrillic script. It looks a bit like it. It's, I think, pronounced ch. Doesn't matter. You'll see what it looks like. It's a nice letter. Underneath E, well, I haven't changed E. E is going to be the same in all languages. So E remains E remains E. Okay, that's, that's, that's a fixed point. Um, oh, now, let's see how we're doing. Um, I've got to correlate my talk, my slides, my pictures, is quite a difficult operation. And my timing. Okay, oh, that's all right, I've got more time than I thought. So, um, now, I think at this stage, I, well, let's try, if I go forward there, and forward there, let's see. Have I got the Lee groups there? Good, it all agrees. Uh, well, I got the Lee groups because uh, in the history of mathematics, uh, one of the most important things we've discussed is group theory, 
and Lie groups particularly play a very important role in geometry, in physics, in number theory. They are almost universal. And of course, as you heard, uh, the person who first pressed for the existence of a prize to recognize Abel was Sophus Lee. Sophus Lee on the left, those days you had to have a beard to be serious. So he has a nice big beard. And he was a very good mathematician in his own right. So he created the theory of Lie groups. Lie groups are called after Sophus Lee. And alongside Sophus Lee, people who followed up and developed the theory, there was the famous French mathematician Elie Cartan. And you see how beautifully trimmed the beard and moustache were. That was the days when gentlemen were gentlemen. And, you know, he was much better dressed than anybody here. But nowadays, standards have changed. We've done the same. And then on the right hand, the last person on this list is one of my real heroes, the great Hermann Weyl, a German mathematician. He was also uh, very, f very famous to mathematics and to physics, well known. Everybody, uh, was the, he was the sort of main um, pupil of Hilbert. And uh, he ended up at the Institute for Advanced Study, which is where I was, but I was too late to meet him. But I did hear him talk. And I did hear him talk at the International Congress of Mathematicians in Amsterdam in 1954. Now, believe it or not, I went to that Congress. I was a second year graduate student. Are there any second year graduate students here? Well, I hope so. And I, I heard him talk because he was presenting the Fields Medals. Presenting the Fields Medals to Jean-Pierre Serre, who was the youngest Fields Medalist ever, and is now the oldest Fields Medalist. I mean, he's been a Fields Medalist, he was 28, 28, he's now age 92. If you do your sums, you'll work out that's a long time. He's still alive. He sent me my best wishes for this talk. And so he has, he also, by the way, the first Abel Prize winner. So he has many records. Um, anyway, that was digression. But uh, uh, I'll come back to him later. Anyway, Hermann Weyl was a great figure. And I, I, I bow before him, metaphorically speaking. Now, uh, I was trying to go back to the script. Um, let's see. Um, what, where should I go next? Yes. Um, now, in all these formulae, there's one important formula in mathematics, the most important formula in all of mathematics, the most beautiful formula in all of mathematics. We all know what it is. It's Euler's formula, e to the 2 pi r equals 1. It's a formula that has all the important symbols in it, e pi i. What more can you want? And that formula is a miraculous formula, as we know. It's sort of, and as r, it involves the complex numbers. So Archimedes couldn't have discovered that because the complex numbers were not there. But once the complex numbers were there, Euler made this formula. It's the most beautiful formula in mathematics. Uh, and I like to compare it when I talk to people from other cultures with the most famous phrase in English literature, which comes from Shakespeare, and is the phrase, to be or not to be. It's very short letters, very simple letters, but very deep meaning. And that is the literary equivalent of Euler's formula. Yeah, I think you, you can't disagree. The Euler's formula is so beautiful, so short, and to be or not to be is you know, one of the great short bits in Shakespearean world literature. So that, I, that, if you hadn't heard that before, I offer it to you as a story. Now, so e to the 2 pi i equals is the most important formula in mathematics. Right, so now let, where, where do we go from there? Well, um, uh, I'm going ahead of myself a bit, but um, let me go back to the table. So if I go back to the table, uh, I can see the table. And so, uh, yes, you could see the table too. So in that table, I told you that uh, <coughs> that is the, the, top, the top row has E, and then when you get the complex numbers in, you get I. And so you write an Euler's formula. Now, the row underneath it has other letters, which, uh, what's the role of the other letters? Well, they are, in some sense, the f top row has to do with the real and complex numbers. The next row has to do with the quaternions. Now, I don't know how much you know about quaternions, but they're invented by Hamilton. And in some ways, they're used very much by physicists. 
but they involve the quaternions, and famously, the quaternions are the first example of non-commutative algebra. When you multiply quaternions, the order matters. And it was Hamilton's great genius to realize that commutative multiplication did not need to be commutative. He was the first person to realize that. And he, he realized that when he was crossing a bridge in Dublin, you can go to Dublin, and on that bridge you will see, here Hamilton discovered quaternions, and he didn't write them on the bridge at that moment. That would have been graffiti. But now there is a plaque. The plaque says, on this day, that hour, Hamilton crossed the bridge and he discovered quaternions. It's, it's a occasion when history has recorded an event. It didn't record when the apple fell on Newton's head. You know, it didn't record when Archimedes jumped out of the bath. But when Hamilton crossed the bridge, that was recorded. And you can go to Dublin and see it. So, so the quaternions are not commutative. That means it's very difficult. We heard about polynomials in the last lecture, I think, uh, or before. And polynomials are very nice because they commute. You know. But non-commutative polynomials are, seem to be terrible. What can you do with them? Well, you have to be clever. And if you're clever enough, you find you can manage to do that. I'll tell you later how you do it. And when you've done it, then you can repeat what you do with the complex numbers with the quaternions. So this second row, which is in red, is meant to be the quaternic version of the first row. So you replace pi by this funny symbol, j, and you replace j, and you write e, and now you write down a corresponding formula to Euler's formula. You write down, instead of e to the 2 pi i equals 1, you write down e to the 2, and you replace pi by this j, and you replace i by some other number, and you get a sort of correct formula. So it's the quaternionic version of Euler's formula, and that is beautiful. In fact, it's more beautiful because you've dealt with a more difficult problem. And that is the st this lecture is really about that process. How do you go from the form Euler's formula to the quaternionic analog? Try it out. Go home. If you, don't listen to me anymore. Or get out of your pad and try and do it. What? How do you get that formula? Well, that's the the main content of this lecture. Uh, so I mustn't go too fast, so I'll finish before I, I've got going. I think we're just about doing on time. So uh, now, um, what, is, what is the relationship? I've written down, you see the letters type. Type 1, type 2, type 3. You might ask, what do these methods mean? Where do they come from? Well, for that you have to go through a bit of history, and I think probably the history comes later, uh, let's see, uh, I'm not, the order of these does not correspond to the order of those, you see, it's not commutative. Um, and I think, um, let's see, I, I, yeah, it comes much later. I'm, 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 the name I want to bring up now is the name of von Neumann. Now, most of you probably have heard of von Neumann, Johnny von Neumann, he was the genius. People use the word genius quite often casually. He's a genius. I, I think... I think the list of real geniuses is limited. I would include Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart as a musical genius, undoubtedly. And amongst mathematicians, uh, I might include Srinivasa Ramanujan. But undoubtedly, I would include Johnny von Neumann. He was a genius. And a genius works his own way, magic, and he was a magician. He did everything, you know. He, he, he developed the computer, he developed weather forecasting, he developed Hilbert Space Analysis, he wrote a book for physicists on self joint operators, he, you know, he did everything. And he did it very fast. He could do it faster than you could, you could program your computer. So von Neumann was a genius. And one of the things he discovered, he was studying, I think I've got to go ahead really because they, they obviously they come later on. Well, never mind. Uh, I'll talk. Well, maybe I'll give you some more slides. Let's, let's jump ahead in the slides. And if I, if I think if I press the right button here, let's see. Um, hmm, which way? If I go th that way, yes. And that way, oh, oh what's happened there? Well, that's something come up wrong. What have I got behind me? Einstein. Where should I be? I, somebody, I don't have eyes at the back of my head. Um, and my screens don't quite agree with what I'm seeing. I think I'm going to move this one backwards or forward. 
Well, I'm, what I'm trying to do is to get to... Yes, I'm trying to get to slide 12 here. So if I do... What, what, what number am I on there? Six. So seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Do you see the picture of von Neumann? Because it works. Arithmetic is useful. Now, um, I've entitled this, I've given this title, uh, the slide, the rather grandiose title of Arithmetic Physics. I'll come back to that later. But inside, I have talked a bit about modular forms, lattices. And underneath, I've written von Neumann. Now, one of the things von Neumann did was he developed something which is now called von Neumann algebras. Well, reasonable. And what are von Neumann algebras? Well, this is a theory in which um, dimensions are not measured by integers, but by real numbers. The integers get replaced by real numbers. And that's going from type 1 to type 2. Type 1 means integers, type 2 means real numbers. So he invented these new things, which were called, which had lots of good reasons. They were related to lattices, modular forms, to physics, quantum mechanics, uh, lots of reasons. But anyway, he found there was this marvelous pure bill. He, he invented them. So the von Neumann algebras, in particular von, what are called von Neumann factors for the experts, are things where the dimension is measured by real numbers. Otherwise, it looks the same as the ordinary world. And so, with a little bit of imagine, so that you, what you have to do is to imagine the second row of those slides as being the type two world, is the type two world, which is the von Neumann world, is the von Neumann world of type two, because type one is integers, type two is reals. So now you're going from the type one world to the type two world, it's a very well-known process. And it's, if I like to use Sometimes it's very useful to use words which are not mathematical, to give you a flavor. Think of type one as things on the earth. Think of type two as things in heaven. Where is heaven? Well, it's somewhere up there. So you're on the ground level or you're up in heaven. Type two is the heavenly equivalent. Well, and actually, although that's poetry or theology, you can make mathematical sense of it. It's, in fact, it's, it's useful to have an idea where you are. So you've replaced ordinary numbers, integers, by real numbers. Real numbers like that only exist in heaven. So von Neumann is up there. Actually, von Neumann is so clever, he's jumped backwards and forwards. But so you're in type. So now you, you repeat everything you did by type one in type two. And so Euler's formula gets automatically transformed into a heavenly version of Euler's formula, which is the one I said you can write down. You just copy the symbols the same way, and you get a formula which is correct and very meaningful. And if you examine it carefully, you find it has a lot of hidden depths. And like, but that's technical. I don't want to talk, go into the details. But meet me afterwards. I can explain. There's a paper I've written. Let me explain. So you can explain all this very precisely. It isn't just hand waving, but it's the easiest way to understand it is to think of it like this: There's a earthly world. There's a heavenly world. In the earthly world, we are very primitive, we just use integers, but up in heaven, you have more powerful yardstick, you use real numbers. And the formula is the same, you copy everything. You can copy the world up above, down below. So everywhere you can copy, and so all you need to do to go from type one to type two is to copy. And you copy Euler's formula, and you get the new formula. Now, I must digress a little bit to tell you a bit about the problem in physics. Now, I think this one probably has, uh, let's see, where is it in my slides? Um, it, I've gone past that. It maybe isn't even in my slides. Um, um, I think I have to, um, well, let's say, um, yes, you see, let's go back to the table. Uh, the first row is pi, the second row has this j. Now, the, for one way of interpreting this shift is that uh, pi is classical geometry and um, second row is some kind of quantum version. So you can say you're going from the real world into the quantum world and uh, then the numbers have some physical meaning and the number that I've called, the number that I've called je there 
it answers a physical question. Now, the physics question is concerned with something physicists called the fine structure constant. Now, I'm sure very few of you know what the fine structure constant is. You've got to be a physicist or a very intelligent mathematician. You have physics friends. So, yes, if I asked for how many people know what the fine, constant, fine structure constant is, I don't expect the multitude of hands. So I have to tell you. Well, uh, I think the best way to tell you is to read out a little passage here, written by Richard Feynman. Richard Feynman was a very famous physicist who got the Nobel Prize, brilliant man, a man with he spoke in very punchy language. Here, here is what he wrote. He was talking about this number, which the physicist called alpha, the fine structure constant. Okay, you don't know what it is, it doesn't matter, you can call it alpha. Alpha is something all physicists know. And by the way, I have here a little card, which you, I can carry in my pocket, given to me by somebody who got the Nobel Prize in mathematical engineering. And it gives you all the things you need to know as a practicing scientist. All the numbers, all the quantities, Avogadro's number, Rydberg constant, Planck's constant, Newton's constant, and on the back row, it tells you uh, something about their sizes, their masses. It is sort of little, no self-respecting physicist or engineer would go around without this in his pocket. It's issued by, it's called the Codata list. It is produced by the National Bureau of Standards. It is standard engineering sort of card. So I, I carry it in my pocket always. I recommend it. Um, so if you know that, you find that amongst all the constants they write down in physics, sometimes you can take every con many constants in physics depend on units. C is not a number. C is a velocity. A velocity depends on what you measure it in, meters per second. And every number has, has some dimensions. But if you take two numbers that are the same dimension, their ratio is a pure number. That's got rid of the physics. So that way, you find some pure numbers. That way, the physicists found this number alpha. So they found this m m number alpha turning up everywhere. You know, every bit of physics, you found alpha. You know, ten, and you can ten, make 10 different experiments, totally different, and you always got number alpha. What is, so, so that mystifies them. So here's what Feynman said. Where does alpha come from? Is it related to pi or perhaps e? Nobody knows. It is one of the great, excuse me for language, great damn mysteries of physics. A num magic number that comes to us with no understanding by man or woman. You might say the hand of God wrote the number and we do not know how he, with a capital H, pushed his pencil. Very dramatic statement. They don't, there's a number that's so mysterious, they don't know what it means, they think. Speculate, could it have something to do with pi? No idea. It's, it's a great mystery. And all physicists in their spare time would like to solve this problem. They've been trying for 50 years. Well, I have to say, I've solved that problem. I mean, I hope you, you believe me. We're all friendly mathematicians. You will believe me against the physicists. So we mathematicians can sometimes solve problems that the physicists can't solve. So I claim that I know what alpha is. Alpha is actually the inverse of that number I called pi. So to, go to, to get a mathematical number that answers this question, all you've got to do is take pi, apply the von Neumann algebra process, and then take its inverse. The inverse is essentially the same. I mean, you know one, you know the other. And that gives you the number. And then you can check it agrees with it. So that solved a problem in mathematical physics, which has been troubling physicists for, oops, oh dear, dear, dear. Ah. Let's see if I can pick it up. Ah. It wasn't part of the schedule, but it just shows you that I can still bend down. Right. So, uh, I've got a bit out of order, but I've told you all this lecture's about. I've told you that uh, there is this mysterious number, the fine structure constant, which nobody knew what it was. I claim I found out what it is. And it's very simple. It is simply the, the cosinonic analog of... Uh, pi uh, in, in the von Neumann algebra sense and all this theory of mathematics the theory of von Neumann algebras was worked out a long time ago so that's the old bottles I got new results from old bottles because the bottles have been lying around on the beach and I've just taken the bottle and pulled out some theorem from inside it 
and that turns out to be solving the problem. So you don't need to use fancy new ideas, just look at the old ideas, but look at them with a new eye. So I'm an old man, I can't do new things. All I can do is look at old things with a new perspective. That anybody can do. So that is now, to get the details, you have to work out uh, you know, the details. And for that, we probably have to go back and re re go back through history a bit. So let's see, if I press that one. Let's see if it works. That one should be given. No, that was wrong. Got that one. I'm going back to number 11, and here I'm going to go back. Is that number 11 there? Good. OK, we carry on. 10, 10. 10, 9, 9. Where do I stop? I'm not sure where I'm going to stop somewhere. Oh, by the way, when I'm here, I, you recognize some of the people here. Um, these people uh, were sometimes ref referred to by Yao as the Gang of Four. If you know your Chinese history, you know those are rather notorious Gang of Four. And although they look very different in ages, that's because the photograph was different ages. We were nearly all the, more or less the same age. Well, within five years. And I, you can guess which was the youngest, which was the oldest. Well, I'll tell you a secret. I'm the youngest. And uh, then here's the book, and then Bot, and then Singer. But we were all, we were a gang of four, and we worked together, and uh, uh, we form a group. So now we're going to go back further still. Uh, let's see. Eight. Eight. Uh, now I think I'm going back a little further still. What was I looking for? I don't know what I was looking for now. Ah, is that seven? Is that about foundations? Yes. Well, let's go back one first further. Ah, yes, here we are. Mathematical physics. Uh, I think uh, there are the famous physicists, mathematical physicists of the time. Nobody would dispute. There's Henri Poincaré, who's mentioned in some lectures. I apologize to the French that Poincaré has lost his French accent. Uh, you know, er error in the, in the typo. Then, of course, famous pictures of Einstein and Hilbert. Every, these are the standard pictures. If you want a picture of Hilbert, it always looks like that. Actually, Einstein has many pictures, but this is one. And then on the right hand side, there's a picture of a young man called Paul Mo Mo Maurice Adrien Dirac. And I went to his lectures when I was young, and he was the most brilliant, one of the most brilliant f physicists of his time. Um, and he was uh, uh, younger than the other ones. So mathematical physics had a great period. <clears throat> now, let's see. I was back on Lee groups, that's where I was. Are we on Lee groups? Right. I think we were on Lee groups, yes. So I was talking about Sophus Lee, Ellie Carter, Herman Weil, and then I was going to go forward. Now this time we go this way. That's mathematical physics. So now we're back on track. So mathematical physics, you know, mathematics and physics have been close together all their lives, all our lives, right from the beginning. And uh, people ask me, what is the difference? Well, you know, was Newton a mathematician or a physicist? You know, was Archimedes a mathematician or a physicist? Doesn't make much sense. Uh, was Hil now, Hilbert was a mathematician, but he had a very serious interest in physics. And Poincaré was equally well. So people in mathematical physics moved around. They didn't stay still. They were constantly active. So mathematical physics is a lively subject. It's a great history. And, you know, you shouldn't be apologetic to be a mathematical physicist. You should be proud of being a mathematical physicist. Now, let's see. Where do we go now for this one? Yes, so that was going forward. Let's go now. That, does that say foundations? Good. Now, you see, mathematicians um, worry sometimes about their foundations of mathematics. What is mathematics? Is it built on a rock? Well, yes and no. Physicists think mathematics is solid. If they can get to use mathematics, they're happy. But actually, mathematics is not so sure of itself either. And the people who showed that, well, here's an example. Bertrand Russell, smoking a pipe, was a great logician. And 
uh, he showed that he spent much of his life trying to give the foundations of mathematics. And uh, by the way, just for the sake of those of you who don't know, Bertrand Russell was the only mathematician who ever got a Nobel Prize. But he got the Nobel Prize for literature because he wrote such clear language. So if you're a mathematician and you want to get a Nobel Prize, write well. <laughs> the other possibilities, you can become a physicist and get your physics, or you can become biology, get biology. But the easiest way is just to write well. The next person is L.E.J. Brower. Now, some people that maybe not even remember Brower, he was, but he was the greatest figure, in some ways, the most important figure in mathematics in the first um, quarter or third of the 20th century. He was the creator of modern topology. He did all the foundations of topology, and he proved his very famous fixed point theorem. Brouwer fixed point theorem was a tremendous theorem. It showed you a topological way to show there was a fixed point. A fixed point can mean many things. It can mean eventually solution of a differential equation. It can mean a fi geometrical fixed point. It can, a fixed point, having a fixed point theorem is a universal tool. So he, he was tremendously famous. But that was his first, that was Brouwer Mark I. But Brouwer Mark II came along and said, no, no, it's all very well proving the existence of a fixed point, but if you can't construct the fixed point, what use is it? I can prove, you know, the world is marvelous, but if I can't construct it, it doesn't work. So in the second stage of his life, he became a constructivist. He would only accept a proof if you could do it step by step and get there in a finite number of steps. So you, you had to be able to have a computer which stopped at some point. So that was Brown Mark II. But he wasn't very happy with that, because he, he said, if you do that, you lose all your intuition. We don't think like that. So then in his third stage, he became an intuitionist. Now, an intuitionist was somebody who liked to have both worlds. He, he liked to be a constructivist and classical. And it's very difficult. So in his third stage, he was very difficult to understand. But I think he was a great man. Now, on the right-hand side, we have even the most famous logician of the 20th century, Kurt Gödel. Kurt Gödel was a the man who upset Hilbert's schemes, showed that you couldn't, there were lots of problems you couldn't solve. You know, it was ultimate uh, death to Hilbert's ideas that you couldn't, any mathematician could prove anything. You know, but no, Gödel says there are things, there are things which are true and you can't prove them. And it was, it totally undermined the foundations of mathematics. And, it, and he was a remarkable man. I, I knew him, he was a colleague at the Institute for Advanced Study, and uh, he was really, R remarkable, crazy man. Uh, and uh, well, there are lots of stories about Gödel, but uh, if I run out, run out of the material and I have time for a few stories, I'll come back to them. But we leave the stories aside. He was certainly the greatest mathematical logician of all time. So these are the people who struggled with the foundations of mathematics. And, well, physicists don't care about that, but actually it turned out they do need to care. But let's come to that later on. So now, I think we're, um, how do these two things go? Let's type one, type two. Yes, well now let's, let's keep going. Let's see if this, does this one go forwards? Not backwards. Now that slide is labeled, well, forget about the, the title, the top. It has to do with quaternions and the present. But a, a more suitable title, would actually have been, if I had more time to prepare the seminar, would have been to call that Schemes. To, to notation introduced by Grotendieck, which people talked about sometimes, Schemes. Uh, scheme well, means many different things in different languages. In English, it has m multiple meanings. Uh, a scheme can be plan. It can be, the plan could be a scheme for designing a building, but it could also be a scheme to uh, undermine the government. A scheme is potentially dangerous. If you, you call scheming, you be sent to jail in some places. So scheme is, is very ambiguous, but it, it is very useful mathematically. And here are the three figures that uh, really represent uh, French mathematics after the war, the great period, Henri Cartan, 
the son of Eli Katan. This is the case where both father and son were equally distinguished. And then Jean-Pierre Serre, whom I think I mentioned already, uh, and then Rosendijk, who was out of this world, literally. Uh, that shows him in his prime when he was a young man. He shaved his head. Uh, you can see he's quite cheerful. In his old age, he became quite different. But he, he was really quite a remarkable. And I knew him well. I knew Serre well. I knew Cartan well. So I belonged to the same generation <coughs> as Serre and Car Grotendieck. So these are the people who created the modern theory of algebraic geometry. And now you might think it's quite irrelevant for mathematical physics, but you'd be wrong. Mathematical physics, well, you see, let's see, where did this one go? Yeah, oh, that, that's where it jumps. I've done that. Well, I moved on. This was the gang of four. I mentioned them before, but this is with their order. So what happened was this. Now, let's see, I think I have to... I have to press this. Does that give me topology of the Gang of Four again? Good. Okay, so um, algebraic geometry was to decide, was studying algebraic varieties. If you heard polynomial equations and so on. Uh, but people who do differential geometry or physics aren't interested in algebraic varieties. They're interested in differential manifolds, perhaps. General, why, why, what's algebraic geometry is very specialized. So they were interested in this. And the question was, could you transfer all the beautiful results of algebraic geometry into this domain? And that's what Singer and I did. We, we took the formula, the key formula, riemann roch theorem, and we, we, we moved it from algebraic geometry into in differential geometry. And once it's in differential geometry, it's very close to physics. So this is the way it moved from algebraic geometry to differential geometry into physics. And that was the great era of in the 1960s, I guess, 56, well, I suppose that's when I got my prize. Uh, so this is a great era in which differential geometry and, and mathematical physics came together. But you see, they only came together, now let's see. Uh, I'm trying to go, not backwards. That's 10, this is 10. Does that say unification? Yes, good. Um, well, I was going to digress for a moment and go back to that table, tell you that, um, uh, what was I going to say? I've forgotten now. Um, you see, when you get old, your memory, short-term memory, gets very weak. Um, so um, I think what I was going to say was that, yes, the, it, the, when we, Singer and I and, but extended the, the theorems to differentiable, they were applied by physicists. And immediately, when you go into physics, you have the question of, well, are you doing classical physics? Are you doing quantum physics? And so, you know, we, we were, not, were not sure. If you do classical physics, you, you, you do differential geometry, differential forms, smooth functions. If you do class, quantum physics, you count eigenvalues, discrete things. So one of them is discrete, one of them is continuous. So where are we? Well, a smooth manifold. Well, a oh, smooth manifold, you study waves on a smooth manifold, they have frequencies and you get... So there is clearly some mixture of going on, and that's where this, this table comes in useful. Because if you move to the Cyrillic script, you're automatically moved up a level from one to two. That moving up from one to two moves you from the classical to the quantum. It's one way of thinking of it. So quantum geometry appears at that level. So quantum geometry is the geometry which explains this mysterious number alpha, which comes from physics makes sense that somehow quantum theory should come in, that's correct. So that rounds it all up, very pretty picture. Now, at this stage, we are starting to talk about serious unification. People want to unify lots of things. Here is, I've chosen some three people to illustrate that. There's Gelfand, uh, in many ways the greatest Russian mathematician of his time, who had very many brilliant students. Uh, this is showing him in as most people didn't know him, quite a young man. Uh, everybody's young once, and, but if you are known when you're old, the photographs usually show you an old man. But this is Gelfand as a comparatively young man. And I knew Gelfand very well. He was a very remarkable man, enormous dynamism, mathematically and otherwise. And then next to him, I put Langlands. Well, he just, you heard about Langlands. I think he, he just got, 
He got lots of prizes. He got the Abel Prize this year. Bob Langlands, colleague of mine at the Institute of Advanced Study. The Langlands program is the great big machinery that people are trying to prove. Wiles is proof of the Fermat's last theorem. is part of the program. And, you know, every number theorist around the world is working on the Langlands program. So this is the center of attention of the entire community of algebraic number theory. That's not a bad unification. And aim is, can you unify that with other things? And Langland's theory does unify that in, in very profound ways. So this is a big unification scheme. Now, the last person in this list is Roger Penrose. Now, Roger Penrose is a old friend of mine. We were students together, graduate students together, uh, and we were doing algebraic geometry. But then he went, I went one way, he went another way. I did differential geometry. He went off, started to work with his own stories. And he came into, eventually into physics. And we met again, interested in mathematical physics, but from very different points of view. And Penrose has a very, he's the most deepest thinker in, for example, theory. if you're going to see a, meet a black hole, the guy you want to have with you is Roger Penrose. Uh, if, he, if you can avoid being trapped by a black hole, Roger will find the way out. You know, he's a useful guy to have in, in a dark corner. So Roger Penrose is a really deep thinker. And he's trying to unify things from his point of view, which is not quite as, well, he's not different at all from Langlands. He's a number theorist. Penrose is a physicist. And so he thinks there's no connection. But actually, the aim of unification should be to bring them all together. We should bring in, not to go into geometers, children, we should bring in physicists, number theorists. We want a grand scheme. Imagine this is a hall where we have the phys physicists over there and the number theorists over there and the different ge geometers in the middle. Imagine this is the whole sweep of the intellectual horizon of the world of science. This is a big scheme, scheme of things. So that's the real unification and that's really what I'm after. I, I, when you get to my age, you don't tinker around with elementary problems. You have a horizon on the big things. And so, when, am I over time? No. God, was that? I seem to, I'm not quite. I think that's telling me I'm not. Anyway, I shall wind up very quickly. So, yes. Now, when you look to the future, uh, and you get to that last table, the uh, Octonians, and there's a future mystery. I put down Edward Witten here. If you want to know the future lies, ask this guy. He is the only physicist to have got a Fields Medal. That makes him unique. There may be others to follow, but at the moment, and he developed something called M theory. The beauty about M theory is nobody knows what M stands for. Take your choice. Magic, mystery, mate. Yeah. So this is the future of mathematical physics is almost certainly tied up with this. And he's a good friend of mine, and I, I, I think he's a great guy. Now, I think here we go. And then we got back to von Neumann. I mentioned you. So we all do use von Neumann, and half the story is about von Neumann and arithmetic physics. So arithmetic physics is a term I've coined for the future. Where is the future mathematics going to be? It's going to be the, um, it's going to be unification of everything in sight, at the classical level, the quantum level, and short of anything else, I call it arithmetic physics. There we are. Uh, that's my future forecast. I won't be here to see it, so I can make guarantees. Uh, and then fin finally, I'll finish off this slide, which talks about computability. Because when you do something, you've still got to calculate. You've got to find the number. And that, it turns out, not to be so trivial. And the key guys in, in computation theory were, of course, von Neumann and Alan Turing. So they, this, these are the guys who were involved in the foundation of computer science, and, and I've indicated here the CERN computer and the LIGO experiment for gravitational waves. These are the things that are state-of-the-art technology. So the future lies here, somewhere in this area, and I've given you a little taste of it. I'm sorry I didn't have time. To, I've gone over. Keep that clock seems changing around. I think it's telling me I'm over time, but uh, anyway, I, I think at this stage, I've told you as much as I could possibly tell you Anybody wants to know any more, ask me afterwards. The little corners in that stuff over there I haven't quite explained. But, you know, time is limited. Thank you very much. <laughs> ah. Thank you yes. very much for this tour.
through math and physics. As he said, he might be around and maybe around a little bit for, for questions today and uh, tomorrow also, possibly. Um, this closes today's um, session. So please thank you again. Thank you.